On behalf of the National Family Drug Court Technical Assistance and Training Program, we would like to welcome you to the Learning Academy webinar, What You Need to Know in Becoming a Trauma-Informed Trauma Family Drug Court. Today you will hear from the Honorable Erica Yu of Santa Clara County Superior Court and Dr. Vivian Brown, founder and retired CEO of Prototypes in Los Angeles. Launched in 2010, the Family Drug Court Learning Academy consists of four stages or learning communities. Here you can see the first three learning communities, and these are offer, offered online at our website, www.cffutures.org backslash webinar. You can go ahead and view the past five modules and access the audio portion as well as the handouts that were provided. According to the information you provided during your registration, many of you, this is your first or second time participating in the webinar. Launched in 2012 is the fourth learning community, Advanced Practice. Here you can see the eight webinar topics that will be presented throughout the year. Again, you can access all previous webinar materials and audio recordings on our website at cffutures.org. As discussed previously, we would like to make this presentation as interactive as possible. For our first polling question, we would like to know how you are viewing today's presentation. In a moment, we will launch this polling question and you will have the opportunity to select from the following responses. If you do select response number four, if you can please submit the amount of people that you are viewing this presentation with in the questions box on the right panel, this would be, this would be um, very helpful for us in, in trying to find out what the scale of the audience is. So please go ahead and select your response now. Okay, great. So it looks like the majority of you are viewing this presentation by yourself. And there are some that are viewing this with three or more colleagues. So again, if you can please submit how many colleagues that you are viewing this with in the questions box on the right, right panel, this would be very helpful. Now, I would like to introduce you to Honorable Erica Yu. Judge Yu was appointed to the Santa Clara County Superior Court on October 2nd of 2001. Currently, she is the Juvenile Dependency Division of the court and helped to found Family Wellness Court, a $6.3 million project funded by the federal government and First Five, which serves children under the age of three years whose families are struggling with addiction, homelessness, poverty, violence, and other issues. Family Wellness Court won a Unity and Diversity Award in 2010 from the Santa Clara County Board of Supervisors. Judge Yu has received numerous awards and recognitions, including being named Pro Bono Attorney of the Year and an Unsung Heroes Award from the SCCBA Diversity Committee. In addition, Yu was appointed by the Supreme Court to the Commission on Judicial Performance in December of 2010. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce Judge Yu. Okay, good morning everybody, and thank you Alexis. Boy, you had grace under pressure. That audio thing was sort of getting me a little nervous, and for those of you who are the first time listeners to a webinar, that's really unusual. I've never experienced that before. Um, also, I'm not currently a juvenile judge. I was a juvenile dependency court judge for four years, and I just cycled into a civil assignment. So on to the um, PowerPoint. I was asked to talk about Family Wellness Court, trauma-informed courts, and we wanted to show you how we started and then be able to answer any questions for courts that would like to take a similar path. So how we started is we received a grant to start a family drug court. Um, part of our grant was actually to fund education across the board so that the court our multidisciplinary team members and our part agency partners would all receive training. Lori Drabel of San Jose State told us about Vivian Brown and the concept about being trauma-informed. And so we contacted Ms. Brown and you know she's just done a wonderful job and is continuing to do some training for us in our county. Okay, uh, being a trauma-informed judge to me really is just being a good judge. Um, you don't even have to know about trauma-informed to be a good judge. So I'm gonna start there and then talk about the additional elements that you would wanna be mindful of if you choose to be a trauma-informed court. So generally being a good judge or actually it encompasses characteristics that are required by the judicial canon of ethics. These characteristics go hand in hand with being respectful, observant, thoughtful, and transparent, and explaining the process 
including your ruling and the basis for the rulings. Um, I briefly put this slide up for the California Canon of Ethics and the ADA rule of ethics that are implicated by, you know, just being courteous, patient, dignified, and treating people with respect. Next slide. Um, one of the things that I think is extremely important about both being a good judge and also being a trauma-informed court is the concept of transparency. And just backing up a little bit, we know through public trust and confidence surveys that are done, um, that were done in California in 2005 when approximately 3,000 people were um, interviewed when they left court, they were asked what their, about their court experience. And what we learned was lawyers just care about the outcome. They just want to win. And uh, the litigants, however, really care about the process. They want to know that they were heard, that they were treated with respect, and that their side was given a fair view by the court. They weren't really as invested in winning as they were in the process. Uh, so transparency, we know, is important just as a court. And then we know from what we learned from Vivian Brown, and she'll talk about this later, why transparency is important to trauma-informed systems. It, um, transparency leads to the users of the court to feel respected and understood and included. And I find that when I'm transparent as a judge, it leads to better judging because the more transparent I am with myself and my thought process, the more clear I am as to why I'm making a decision so I can you know, track whether there's any triggers present for me or any biases, and then it forces me to be able to explain things very clearly to the litigants in front of me. So I already talked about the public trust and confidence survey. So um, again, the conclusion from that survey is having a sense that court decisions are made through a process that is fair and that that is the strongest predictor uh, by far of what people who are in the courtroom feel is fair and their ability to have confidence in the court system. I wanted to also talk a little bit about race and language. For us in California, it's a, it's a huge component of how courts deal with litigants. Um, language and race can lead to feelings of power, powerlessness and exclusion. Um, there's certainly a sense of language and race being a barrier to communication or a barrier to a sense of inclusion in a court. Uh, a 2010 Judicial Council report to our legislature in California indicated that there was a 14% increase in the five-year period from 2004 to 2005 in the need for an interpreter, and 147 languages are spoken regularly in California courts. So in California, we see that in that same five-year period, in the Immigration trends led to significant growth of the population in California. 42% of our growth in California was related to immigration. And 4 in 10 people in California live in a household where a language other than English is spoken. 31% of the public um, served by California courts were born outside of the United States. So language is definitely an issue uh, for our litigants and users of the court and will continue to be as we move forward into the future. I also wanted to talk about the concept of emotional intelligence and then tie all this together into how to be a trauma-informed court. I know um, sort of emotional intelligence is somewhat of a new concept, although it's been written about a lot in the general um, sort of press. And it's really, I think, in this country something that we've heard is very important to people's success. More important than IQ is EQ, because EQ is how do you deal with other people? You sort of, do you play well with others? And emotional intelligence has been defined as the innate potential to feel, use, communicate, recognize, remember, describe, identify, learn from, manage, understand, and explain emotions. Um, you know, in courts, we're taught that you need to remove emotion from the courtroom. And jurors even get an instruction that they cannot make their decisions based on passion and prejudice. And I definitely agree that the court's decisions and jurors' decisions should not be based on emotion. But it's really impossible to take emotions out of the courtroom because we have human beings in there. and We're dealing with highly charged emotional issues, especially in a family drug court, because we're dealing with people's relationship with their, their children and with their partners and with themselves, with their addiction, with their own personal personal growth. So I don't think you can take emotions out of the courtroom. You can take it out of the decision-making process. And I think all of us 
have the ability to be highly emotionally intelligent. Um, from infancy, we're emotional and social beings. We cry, we express our emotions, we learn to recognize our parents' emotions to survive as children. And so I think children are the savviest manipulator of emotions, and so you just need to tap into that as a person working in courts to have good emotional intelligence. And so emotional intelligence means you're becoming emotionally lit literate. You're labeling feelings rather than labeling people or situations. We're taking responsibility for our own feelings as people who have authority in the courtroom as judges or court personnel. We're validating other people's feelings, which is such an important, uh, really powerful way to connect with people and help them set aside the emotions that might be flooding them so they can hear what the court or the multidisciplinary team is saying to them. We use emotions to show respect for others. Uh, we don't want to be judgmental, which is kind of interesting because when we started Family Wellness Court, we said we wanted to take the lawyers and the judges out of the courtroom, meaning we wanted to take that adversarial process and the sort of the negative judgment and messages that sometimes come to people who are addicts or who have their children removed from them, we wanted to take all that out of the courtroom. Um, and we wanted to in, use emotional intelligence to make sure that we ourselves weren't triggered. Um, you know, judges get triggered. I know from teaching judges uh, for California courts, that we've asked judges, what are your triggers? And they've said that, you know, sometimes when they have litigants in front of them who are have tattoos or who are uneducated, um, they, they have triggers. Or often people in society get triggered by quote unquote bad parents or addicts or those who commit domestic violence. So for us to really have a good trauma-informed court, we needed to make sure that we were aware of what was triggering us and that we weren't allowing that to to kind of cloud how we interacted with the people in front of us. Um, so really, so important, so critical to what we did was to remove any negative judgment from the courtroom. And later I'll talk about how we made that explicit with the parents who were in front of us. And fairness, um, treating everyone the same. Someone gave me an example where they said, you know, the deputy makes an announcement that no one can text during the court proceeding. And sometimes the deputy even takes away people's smartphones, and yet during the proceeding, the deputy is texting. So, you know, really making sure that everyone on your court team, from your clerk to your deputy to everyone, is ruling, going by the same rules uh, so people feel that they're treated with respect and that they're all on equal footing. Um, let's see. The new considerations for a judge in a trauma-informed court. Uh, it was really quite a challenge because when you're a judge, you go through training, you have a certain mindset, and you're not really, you're sort of trained that you're in charge of your courtroom. You're the person that's got to make sure you do the entire calendar, that you finish on time, that everybody's heard, and you're sort of the one that everything goes through. But running a trauma-informed court with a multidisciplinary team is entirely different, and the judge needs to basically take a much more of a backseat and a much less active role. I mean, definitely setting a tone, being a leader, but being a co-leader and a co-facilitator with other members of the multidisciplinary team so that the multidisciplinary team, um, basically, those members have this equal voice to the judge. The judge is really the team leader, <clears throat> but has to set aside sort of that control and egos, and you kind of have a different you have to have good boundaries, but you have to be able to be flat and not be on top of other people. Um, you also have to be very aware of ex parte communications, and I'll talk a little bit about that more later. Now, one of my favorite quotes, and I shared this with the team uh, when we were doing our training, is that uh, it's from Lao Tzu, that a leader is best when people barely know that he's a, he exists, not so good when people obey and acclaim him, Worse when they despise him. Fail to honor people and they fail to honor you. But of a good leader who talks little when his work is done, his aim fulfilled, they will all say, we did this ourselves. So basically, we didn't even need to judge um, or we didn't even need to leader. And that's sort of what the beautiful thing was, I think, about Family Wellness Court, that there really was a lot of consensus building and people felt um, entitled and invested in the court. Um, we learned also 
in preparing this trauma-informed court experience for our litigants that from Vivian that 50 to 60 percent of the outcome really rests upon a positive therapeutic alliance and only one to two percent is related to the treatment model or methodology and that was really radical for me when I was um, hearing this because you know you hear about evidence-based practices and all these different models um, but really that therapeutic alliance is so important and that comes from having a trauma-informed court and treating people with respect and transparency. 20 years of adult drug court research indicates that the number one incentive for people in their criminal drug court um, experience is their relationship with their judge or their probation officer, which again shows why that therapeutic alliance is so important. Uh, so for considerations for a trauma-informed court, um, one thing that I tried to really strive hard to do in the courtroom is to give an illusion of time. It was sort of like if we were in a play, and in the courtroom when the litigants were with us, we really tried to take our time, and I would even say, take your time, you know, I don't feel nervous, tell us what you want to say. But in between hearings, we'd say, hurry up, you know, we have 11 more cases, and we only have one and a half hours, let's speed it up. So, you know, we would try to create that illusion of time so people would feel that they could sit down in their chair and be comfortable and connect with the team. We would try to reduce waiting um, up for people to, before they got in the courtroom. And when we did uh, client surveys, that was definitely something that they told us that was hard for them is the waiting. Um, we tried to make as little noise, a, a sort of ambient noise as possible. So we even tried to control people coming in and out of the courtroom if they didn't need to be there. Um, and we really stressed the concept of honesty, respect, hope, and transparency. Um, and we um, tried to make sure that the physical courtroom environment was welcoming. So this is what a typical courtroom looks like in, Cal in America. You know, there's deputies, it's male, there's big audience section, it's crowded with a lot of audience people sitting there. There's straight tables, there's physical distance between the judge. Um, and the litigants, judges higher, farther away, emotional distance, very impersonal, lots of security-oriented stuff going on, and children are often not um, allowed in the courtroom, and people can't talk unless they're um, supposed to talk. This is what our family wellness courtroom looked like, even to the extent of having a welcome sign on the door and stickers that made it sort of more welcoming for people. I even put my schedule for the month out in the door so all the lawyers and multidisciplinary team members would know when we were in session, where we would be. Um, our bench is lower and the council table is more in a horseshoe so that people would feel uh, there's this physical reminder that we're all in this together. Um, we had prints on the wall that children could relate to um, and you know little stickers on the on the walls there was a bulletin and board in the back so that any parent who was successful got their picture with the team and they got to be on the um, board as part of the courtroom team and we would say you are going to go on this board and you will serve as an inspiration for other parents coming behind you um, and then we had to get to a second board because we had so many successful parents we had a little place in the courtroom for the children so that they could be occupied and play and you know we would clean up in between, but often the kids would have everything on the floor, and we'd tell the parents, don't worry, you know, this is their space too. Um, so we really tried to make this environment physically welcoming. We let the kids move the stickers around. They would take stickers out with them. We had kids' paintings on the wall. Um, so our hearings would occur sometimes for parents daily, weekly, twice a month, once a month, depending on what the parent's progress was. In the beginning, sometimes um, the parent would basically be using, and we would have a bus token for them, and we'd say, you could get a bus token today, but go to a meeting today. Come back tomorrow and bring us your meeting slip, and you will get another token. And we would see them daily for a little while until they kind of got to a place where we could then see them weekly, and then eventually we'd see them once every few months until they were ready to have their case dismissed. Um, we would have very comprehensive staffings. We had a consultant who said that we had the most comprehensive staffings he had seen in his whole career, and he had worked with healthcare providers and therapists. Um, but we would have basically all the various agencies represented through multidisciplinary team members. Before our staffings, we would have an exchange of reports from home visitors 
from um, drug rehab counselors. We would share those reports. We had consents that took quite a long time for us to work out. Um, so that we could share the information. And everybody kind of had a sense of where this parent was and also where the child was because um, our grant not only allowed us to provide screening and services to the parent, but critical to what we wanted to do was we provided um, this for the child as well. And through First Five, which is funded through tobacco taxes in California, every child and family wellness court got approximately $6,000 worth of services free to the parents. And that was screening and assessment. Um, we, ex we would talk as a team about what incentives we would give and what sanctions we would give and what resource information we would give so that we um, basically had agreement or consensus from the team. Uh, we tried to always use strength-based language. We wanted to have a therapeutic courtroom environment. Um, parents were given positive feedback on their progress. And also we talked to them um, and, and gave them sanctions and, and explained why we were giving them sanctions in the most transparent way that we could. And I'll talk more about that when I talk about um, our orientation. The providers um, would problem solve with the client to help them identify their needs and address how to um, um, redress their needs. We really tried to not tell the parents what to do, but have them be part of the problem solving. And we would expressly say, part of what we're trying to do, our goal is to help you connect with these resources later when the court is, uh, case is dismissed, that you will be able to navigate this yourself. And hopefully, you won't need to come back into this court system. We actually had a huge library of different resources that we could give people in the community so they would feel that the courtroom was a place that would help them um, instead of a place that would judge them and punish them. So if they needed to get a tattoo removed, we had a list that told them, here's where you go to get your tattoos removed. Here's the bus schedule that you take to get there. Here's the hours. Here's the languages. There's a matrix. You pick the one that works best for you. Um, if you need food, this is where you go. If you need clothing, this is where you go. Um, and I used interns to do that, to collect all the information. So we did that for free, and it wasn't part of well, how we spent our grant money. So this is how parents felt, because um, we did several client uh, surveys, and they were confidential surveys. So this parent said, when I went to court, I always had a voice. I didn't just sit and get talked about. I wasn't just talked about from different views. I actually was given a choice. Do you have any concerns, anything that you need? I was given a chance so I should speak up and not be overlooked and talked about among everybody. Um, we would tell the parents they were the most important team member, the most important person in the room. So this is about our orientation. Every parent had the same information at orientation. And um, as we started to build the populace in our courtroom, we had so many more parents. We went from individual orientations to group orientations, but we wouldn't do parents of the same child together. Um, and so we knew everybody was getting the same message. And the first was we would say that the most important thing is that there be truth. Um, basically, we committed that we would tell them the truth at all times, even if it was hard for us, because that's how we showed them respect. And we wanted them to be truthful to us. And that statement allowed us to go back when we were sanctioning people or when we believed they were not telling us the truth and they were, you know, using but and they were manipulating test results, we'd say, remember at the orientation, we told you that the most important thing um, about what we're doing here is to be honest. Because when you're clean, it's, you can be, you know, honest and clear. And it's when you're using that you're hiding and not being honest. So we're, we, you know, we're not saying you're using, but we're saying that this test result said blah, blah, blah. And in our efforts to show you respect and be as straight with you as we can, we got to tell you that it looks like you're using, it looks like this, and you're putting your relationship with your child in jeopardy because of X, Y, and Z. The second thing we would tell them in the orientation is that they had 28 partners and 82 resource providers available to them through Family Wellness Court, either represented in the courtroom through the multidisciplinary team members or through those members who would um, you know, connect to these resource providers. So that often you would see the parents' eyebrows go up and they would just feel so comforted that they really had what we called a real safety net to provide services for you and your child so you can be successful in this court experience. And when you get out of here, you can connect with those resources on your own. 
um, when we would tell them, tell us what you need. We see it as our job to help you connect with what you need. So we want you to tell us, and we know that's one of the hardest things that we ask our parents to do because often they feel that they don't deserve this connection or they don't they don't know how to ask or they've had a lifetime of asking where no one stepped up for them but this is going to be different you tell us what you need and we will try to find those resources and connect you with them so we tried to set the tone promoting the therapeutic alliance right at the orientation trying to um, build trust and we would sort of I would call it bribe them by giving them things that they need we really worked hard to make sure that people could get diapers for free whenever they came to court they get diapers and even though the parents were using they would and you know and often they'd feel emasculated by the dependency system we wanted them to feel empowered so even if they were using we would give them things to give to their child at the visit so they could feel that they were getting some power, bringing diapers, bringing educational books or toys. And then we would write everything down in these reminder sheets so that everything was transparent and explicit when people left. They knew what they were supposed to do and when they were supposed to come back. So we opened Family Wellness Court doors March 14, 2008. As of April 2011, um, we were found we were providing one to two years of services per family because we were helping them through reunification and family maintenance. We served 290 parents. We had three reentries, mostly because they had housing and mental health issues. Three reentries in three years out of 290 parents. Um, and in California, the reentry rate is actually 11 to 12 percent, so three is a much smaller percent. And we started Family Wellness Court because we saw parents who were having multiple pause talk births. You know, they're in dependency court, the child's removed, they go out and have another pause talk child. I mean, you know, up to eight children previously removed. Um, and in three years, we had one subsequent pause talk birth. And, and for us, that was really um, a mark of success. So about our reunification rates in 2009, in our county, we had a 48% reunification rate for all cases, whether the child was a fast track case, meaning the child was removed at the age of three, where the parent only really has six months initially to try to reunify, or you know, 17 and the parent has up to 18 months. In 2010, the reunification rate uh, was 53%, and again, that included the whole population. In September 2010, in our fast track cases, we had a 75% reunification rate, and that was based on federal audits because of our federal grant. And of the 350 children served, 100%, whether they stayed with the parent or not, were assessed, provided services, um, ho um, home visitation services, and whatever they needed to catch up because they all our children were pause talked or drug exposed. In terms of sanctions, we had short-term and long-term um, sort of behavior modification goals. We learned that Sanctions are really good for short-term behavior modification, but incentives work better for long-term behavior modification. In California, we cannot incarcerate parents in dependency court, so we couldn't use flash incarceration, which is what is often used in criminal drug courts. We actually had these self-tests um, that, again, I had an intern do, so we didn't have to pay for that, and she had a background in education. We had her research a bunch of issues that the team identified as being important, why sugar is not good for your diet? Um, how come smoking is not good when you're pregnant? Um, why is why are meetings important? What is the real meaning of recovery? And it was a one-page thing that had graphics, pictures, it was colorful. And on the back, there were four self-test questions. And we would have the parent do these self-tests as a sanction on the subject that was related to what was going on for them in their life with their parent mentor so that there was a discussion and there was really some type of learning that came out of it. We would sometimes have them go to additional um, recovery meetings. Sometimes they'd have to write essays about what they did or why they did it. Um, and they, uh, we would sometimes bring them back more frequently. Um, we would d express our disapproval or, or disappointment in the courtroom as a team, um, but still trying to always be strength-based in our communication and, and be always giving them constant positive regard. Um, we told them that relapses were understood but not excused. Um, we never sanctioned in connection to their visits with the child, and we would talk to them about what the ultimate sanction was, which is their termination of parental rights and loss of the child. Um, and the slide's not moving. 
Okay, so this is about our incentives. Oops, trying to go back to the other slide. Um, Alexis, can you take over and go back? Sorry, I don't know how to do that yet. Um, okay, thank you. So this is our fishbowl right here. And the fishbowl was filled with different colored slips of paper, and people could either get a white slip of paper, which they could save coupons. And if they saved coupons at various different levels, they could redeem them. If they saved eight, they could get something like a digital camera or a digital camcorder or an iPod. And it took a long time for them to get eight because they had to be perfect and do all their meetings, test clean, and do you know their programs, etc. Or they could take a slip of paper that we had different colors for men or women or you know for families, and they could get a game or a toy or something smaller. Um, we would a talk as a team about what they um, get in terms of um, incentives of toys or books. Um, and I mentioned the diapers already. We would connect them to things. So if they were doing well, we could connect them. They could have vouchers and be connected for um, um, housing information, or they could be put on a special calendar for criminal cases that they had where they were on probation and they wanted to have their fines converted to community service. We had something called stages and phases where they could earn moving up to other stages and feel good about that accomplishment. Um, at the end, we had completion ceremonies for them where they could have their photograph and go on the bulletin board. Everyone who completed successfully got a solidarity bracelet. And the team and the judge, I wore mine 24-7, and I explained their award all the time in solidarity with every parent who was in this elite group who was able to successfully complete. Um, they wouldn't have to come to court as much, and they got a lot of praise. And the praise was really quite a big incentive for people. Uh, we learned from Stephanie Covington that this population in dependency court are sometimes the poorest of the poor. In terms of our demographics, we had 65% of our people's chronic homelessness, 45%, 40 some percent were former foster children, about 90 some percent former incarceration, 100 percent you know, um, some type of trauma history, 90 some percent crossover, 80, 90 percent crossover with domestic violence. So, Stephanie Covington said, you know, these are the most hopeless of the hopeless, and your job as this team is to be um, basically uh, the beacon of hope until people feel that they can be hopeful themselves. And Vivian will talk about and ta taught us about the importance of being respectful and hope. And what I would say is, to the team is, look, we've got to treat these people with so much respect because they don't feel they deserve it. And and until they learn that they should respect themselves, we need to be respectful. And we want to be transparent. We would bear witness and remind people about how far they come. I'd say, remember that first day you were here? And remember when you said blah, blah, blah? Because I, I could remember. I'd take good notes. I said, do you remember how that felt? How do you feel now? And so that they could really celebrate how far they had come. So we would honor their past and the present past. And we would remind people whether they fell down or they were doing something that was not so helpful to them or they were using or relapsing, we would say, nobody can go back and start a new beginning, but anyone can start today and make a new ending. And we had that quote on a bulletin board in the courtroom. And we would ta remind them, and at the end, they got a card that was signed by the whole team that would say, that would quote Gandhi and say, happiness is when what you think, what you say, and what you do are in harmony. Because when you're using just, you know, there's just there's too much not being truthful and compartmentalization. In the end, I think having a good trauma-informed court comes down to really bedside manner. It's about the people and the relationships, going back to that therapeutic alliance. It's so important for the team to be respectful of each other and well-calibrated, and we have to have good connections within the service providers. It, in our community, family wellness court meant something. It had, you know, a cachet to it so that people would want to help our family wellness court parents. They would get to bump other people and go to the head of the line. In fact, at orientation, we would give parents a little business card that would have their name and say they were a family wellness court parent because we learned that there were some parents out in the community saying they were in family wellness court so they could bump people in the line and they weren't. So we, the parents felt really special that they had a business card with the court seal on it that said they were in family wellness court. Um, we, as we kind of grew, we found that people wanted to come and be partners with us. So the Office of Women Policy raised enough money so we could buy diapers for the kids for a year. Toys for Tots gave us 
toys for kids for a year and a year and a half. The students that came to watch us from law schools um, were so impressed with the court that ev so far every year they've had a Christmas drive for toys for our family wellness court children. We learned that you, we really want to reparent the parents who themselves um, didn't have great parenting experiences as children. Non-judgment was so key. And also motivational interviewing, meeting the parent where they were and trying to motivate them to kind of move forward. And then really the love in the room. And that came about because parents would say, I love you, Judd. And you know, as a judge, you can't really say I love you back. And team members, we were all feeling kind of not sure what to do. So then I said, well, there's so much love for you in the room. Can you feel the love from the room? And they really responded to that. And parents have quoted that when they would speak in public. Successful parents talk about family wellness will say, I remember when the judge would talk about the love in the room, because that's really that unconditional positive regard, reparenting the parent and helping expand their capacity to love themselves and love their child, but not doing it in a way that's sort of willy-nilly, you know, not holding them accountable, because parents who love their children are firm and hold their kids accountable. Um, and we would talk to the parents and say, family wellness court, it's not good enough to not use. We're not about abstinence. We're about healing. And we saw that this healing would spread to basically beyond the parent-child relationship. But parents would come in and say, God, I can't believe it. For the first time ever, my brother's talking to me. And it's so neat that I can show him not, I'm not using. He hasn't talked to me in five years. So you know, the healing really went beyond what was happening in the courtroom. So here are some good quotes about love and why love is important that you can come back to because I think I'm running out of time. Um, um, but Ann Louise Wagner was one of our therapists dedicated to family wellness court parents. And she said, if we do not love our clients, we re-wound them. So love was really central to not just what was happening in the courtroom, but our partners as well and what they were doing to support the parents in tandem with what's going on in the courtroom. And why I think you know, drug treatment courts or problem-solving courts or therapeutic courts work is because people really do want to do better. They don't know how. And I think the human spirit is strong. And if they, they can, they're so smart. They can tell if you're just brushing them off and if you're not having an authentic relationship with them. But genuine, constant, positive regard really penetrates through people's pain and builds trust. It sounds sort of Pollyanna-ish or maybe sort of, I don't know, slogan-ish, but I actually saw it happen in our 75% success rate and one pause talk subsequent birth in three years really shows the difference. Um, and I always said, don't discount the power of bribery or incentive. Um, in fact, Nelson Mandela said, we want to surprise them with our restraint and generosity because the court sits in such a powerful relationship with the parents, they do not expect that incentive. They don't expect to be treated with love in the room from their previous experience. And so when you do that, it really goes through, it penetrates people's sort of shield. And in the end, people love their children. And so if they feel that you can help them connect with their child, they're going to respond to that. So um, sorry, there was a qu another quote from a parent about why Family Wellness Court worked for them. And we had an attendee question about flash incarceration, and that means putting someone in custody overnight. So in criminal court, you know, if someone came in with a dirty test, you could say, okay, you're being remanded now. I'll let you out tomorrow, but you're going in because you used. In dependency court, we couldn't incarcerate, so we couldn't have flash incarceration or short-term incarceration as a tool. And so what this parent said about love in the courtroom and why it works is, what was beneficial for me was the encouragement they gave. They give you. They give you so much encouragement and acknowledge every good thing you do. I got teary-eyed every time they would acknowledge me for all the good that I've done. You know the hard work. I overcame the hard stuff in my life. Now it's getting easier and easier. They acknowledge every single thing you do, and that's what makes me want to go on more. It encouraged me to do good things because I'm getting acknowledged by these people in the court. And I would say when we started, we would have parents who were crying, you know, tears in the courtroom of shame and fear. And in the end, it was like tears of joy, tears of rediscovery, tears of happiness. It was really quite an experience. And, um, and I'm happy to answer questions for those of you who'd like to follow in this path. And I think you'll find it great, greatly rewarding. Thank you so much, Erica. That was some wonderful and innovative information.
Um, okay, so it is now time for our second polling question. Please respond to the following statement by selecting one of the provided answers. To what extent does your FDC program activities and settings ensure the physical and emotional safety of participants? Please select your answer now. Okay, we're going to go ahead and close the poll now. Wonderful. So it looks like most of the uh, Family Drug Court program activities and settings um, you do to some extent ensure the physical emotional safety of participants. So that's wonderful news to hear. Next, I would like to introduce you to our present, to next presenter, Dr. Vivian Brown. Dr. Brown is founder and former CEO of Prototype, Centers for Innovation in Health, Mental Health, and Social Services, a multi-facility, multi-service, nonprofit agency with services located throughout Southern California. She has more than 40 years' experience developing innovative, community-based services and has conducted numerous treatment outcome research and evaluation studies including the Women, Co-Occurring Disorders, and Violence Study. Thank you, Dr. Brown, for being with us today. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be with all of you today. I'm going to try to advance the... What I want, <laughs> what I want to discuss with you today is the importance of the trauma-informed services in family drug court and what is trauma-informed services and also discuss trauma-informed systems assessment to help transform the system family drug court and then what's needed for that transformation. Start with the high prevalence of trauma uh, and substance abuse and mental health disorders in family drug court populations. What was important was when we started to really do the research, looking at people who were in substance abuse treatment, in mental health treatment, in health programs, in criminal justice programs, we saw the same picture over and over again, which was a high percentage of trauma. In fact, it was quite outstanding when you looked at uh, even the criminal justice programs not only did you see the high prevalence of trauma, but of course substance abuse and mental health problems. And in women, we had multiple traumas from childhood into the teens and then into adulthood. Somewhat different pattern for women than men. For men, that doesn't mean men didn't have traumas and don't have traumas, but if they had early childhood, you didn't keep seeing that repeated pattern into adulthood except, of course, when we have war, and then that's a different story. Men and trauma during the wars uh, you know, exceeds most of the other problems. We also saw that not only do we have high prevalence uh, of trauma, but in many cases it was unidentified and not part of a treatment plan if the person was in substance abuse treatment or mental health treatment or even in health programs. So we really began to talk about trauma as an expectation, not an exception. We also, of course, need to understand the impact of trauma on children, but the parents need to understand that they, too, may have been traumatized, and to reduce the possible re-traumatization of both parent and child. Um, could I have some help going back? I'm having a little trouble there. Slide. Failure to identify. Thank you. So if we don't identify the trauma, our treatment is really incomplete. And we may see that the person leaves services early, that we have inadequate or inappropriate services, that they may be re-traumatized, increase in relapse events, increase in management problems, and poor treatment outcomes. And one of the things that I want to mention here is the uh, SAMHSA study that you may have heard in my uh, biographical statement there. Um, SAMHSA funded a five-year study, the Women with Co-Occurring Disorders and Violence Study. Very important national study, nine sites in the country looking at the women with co-occurring disorders and violence uh, histories or current domestic violence. 
looking for best practices. And in addition, four sites were also looking at the children. So prototypes was one of the nine sites as well as the four sites. We did both the women and children. And it was that study that really launched, I think, the national acknowledgement of trauma-informed services and trauma-specific services. And that's what uh, I'm, my presentation is really focusing on. Do I have controls back on the slides? So what does it really mean to be trauma-informed? Traumatic events shatter our client's trust, particularly when the trauma has been caused by another person. So if your trust has been shattered, why would you trust someone to help you, particularly when power and control were taken away from you due to the traumatic event? People who've been hurt and traumatized enter the relationship with us, any new relationship, and of course relationship with us, reaching out to help them when they've been traumatized, they expect harm, betrayal, and victimization. And so when you encounter a fight, flight, or freeze response, think trauma first. And by that, I'm really saying that if you come into a, a session with someone and they are angry, think trauma first. If they're ready to leave and say they do, really don't belong there, think trauma first. And of course, you see more freezing response uh, when we're talking about children, because children often cannot fight or flee, and they may have the frozen response to the trauma. Again, think trauma first. And it's really the trauma lens that I'm talking about, and you'll hear me say that a number of times today. Uh, our first job is really to help the client gain a sense of safety so that they feel, begin to feel more trust in us. Again, I'm sure you understand that if you've been traumatized, you have a special sensitivity to feeling controlled, humiliated, or criticized by authority figures. And of course, you heard Judge Hugh talking about her just watching Judge Hugh is probably one of the most trauma-informed experiences you can have. Um, she does everything to ensure that the person sitting in front of her does not feel controlled, humiliated, or criticized by an authority figure. So that hypervigilant attention that the trauma survivor has, they are watching, they are listening, our tone of voice, our body language, our pace of speech, our facial expressions, every piece they are watching and listening to so that they can stay, stay as safe as possible with us. They, again, with the fight responses, they may have to attack us before we attack them. Trauma severs connections, and so it's our attachment, our relationship with the person that hopefully that will that will help them gain back a sense of safety and to be able to regulate their arousal, because that hypersensitivity and hypervigilant stance keeps them from really uh, relaxing and being able to uh, soothe themselves. So what we're really trying to do with a family drug court uh, for clients is to focus on safety. And that becomes our first and primary uh, reason for the trauma-informed court. We're trying to gain, help the clients gain control over overwhelming symptoms because when you are triggered because of some trauma memory, you are overwhelmed. The past becomes present and it's alive right there and the client can no longer think or regulate their emotions. We want to help them remove themselves from dangerous situations whenever possible to eliminate self-harm, and to attain healthy self-care for themselves and their children. And I think you know, you heard Judge Hugh and, and you know, I want to repeat the idea that if we can help the parent, 
their trauma, we then help the child and prevent future trauma. So I like to talk about the four S's for safety, which is that safety means modifying the environment to reduce stimuli and induce calming. And you can see from the slides the way uh, Judge Hugh and the Family Drug Court in Santa Clara even helped change the environment, the court environment. Support, the second S, is, involves listening and talking in support of the other. And I want to say here that this is not enabling. This is not uh, trying to uh, reinforce codependency. This is understanding that our clients have been traumatized. And if you've been traumatized, you need someone who can stay calm, listen to you, and talk in support. There's also the structural techniques, which include limit setting and conveying behavioral expectations. So it is not, you know, this is a, a, a free for all. We're just going to be very supportive. There are limits and there are behavioral expectations, but those are said and presented in a way. And the fourth S is symptom management, and we want to help the person uh, reduce their anxiety and their agitation through relaxation methods, stress reduction, and new coping skills. A person who has been traumatized needs to learn new coping skills. So again, trauma-informed court would take into account the role and the impact of trauma and violence in the lives of the people that we're serving. We accommodate to the multiple vulnerabilities and the strengths of trauma survivors. And we're always balancing the two so that we want to reinforce the strengths. People who have been traumatized and have survived are survivors because they were able to cope. But sometimes the coping, such as substance abuse, uh, may then cause additional problems and keep them from resolving them. So we want to establish safety first in both physical and emotional areas. Services are delivered in a way that avoids triggering trauma memories of causing unintentional re-traumatization. That, to me, is extremely important. And, and we want to make sure that what we are doing with the client is not re-triggering or triggering the trauma memories. And again, we are all working very hard. We are trying to do our best. And unintentionally, we may be triggering because we don't always know what the trigger might be for this certain individual. But trauma-informed means that we change the way we view the people we serve, the way we view our services, the way we deliver our services. We look through the trauma lens at all times. And we want to understand that this person most likely has been traumatized, and that we can do something about it. And we want to support client control and choice whenever possible. Let me just give an example about some of the unintentional uh, issues. Uh, we, emergency rooms, so we can look at something a little distant from the family drug court. In emergency rooms, we realize that when women went into the emergency room with broken limbs and bashed heads, no one asked them about domestic violence. They kept returning over and over again then to the emergency room with more and more broken limbs and more and more brain damage. So we want to be able to identify the trauma, and we want to make sure that we're not re-traumatized. Part of the way we look at the person is what happened to you not what's wrong with you or what's your problem. And that is that paradigm shift toward the trauma-informed. I want to also then talk about the difference between trauma-informed and trauma-specific. Trauma-specific services are those services designed specifically to address the trauma, violence, and related symptoms. So, Many of these are groups 
and with a with a structured curriculum. And I'm going to share some of those with you in the next slide. But the groups that I'm going to be sharing with you are all what we call stage one interventions. Uh, those of you who are not familiar with Judith Herman's work may want to read her wonderful volume on trauma and safety. She really did an outstanding job and talked about the three stages of trauma work. Stage one is safety and stabilization. Stage one, we do not open the trauma story. We do not go into depth about the trauma. We work with safety and stabilization. Stage two takes us into the trauma story. But we are staying on stage one in the family drug court. In individual treatment, you will move into stage two and deal with the trauma story. And stage three, then, is that whole reconnection. So let me share with you, and again, the goals of the services, of course, are to have the sense of safety, sense of control, and increase coping skills. Let me share some of the evidence-based practices for trauma-specific interventions. Seeking Safety uh, by Lisa Najovitz. Trauma Recovery and Empowerment, uh, known as TREM, by Maxine Harris and Community Connections. Target AR, which is Trauma Adaptive Recovery Group. And that is by Ford and their colleagues. These are evidence-based practices that you would use for adults. And on the next slide, we have evidence-based practices that are trauma-specific for children. And that's trauma-focused cognitive behavioral therapy, parent-child interaction therapy, et cetera. These have been studied and show uh, excellent results. I want to mention EMDR. Uh, it is a technique that has been moved into evidence-based. Uh, it's a rapid eye movement. Uh, it's been used individually. It's not a group uh, curriculum. And it's, it is an intervention that I have been trained in. I believe it is very powerful, but it is not stage one. It's going to take you stage one and stage two. So the ones I'm presenting here are the stage one evidence-based practice. Now I want to talk a bit about the trauma agency or system assessment, because you've heard me talking about ensuring that we're trauma-informed and not re-traumatizing survivors. Uh, in 2004, Maxine Harris and Roger Fowler developed an agency self-assessment. And it looked at these five core elements, safety, trustworthiness, collaboration, choice, and empowerment. Uh, let me just say the trustworthiness is on the level of, um, and you heard Judge Hugh talking about some of these ways of being trustworthy, is to share and be transparent and let the person know what to expect and to orient them. And the collaboration is the collaboration between the helper and the survivor. Now, I uh, adapted this assessment. By the way, Maxine Harris and Roger Fallett are colleagues of mine. We've worked together on the uh, SAMHSA study, and we've continued to work together. And I adapted the assessment into a system agency walkthrough that allows people to walk through their system or agency through the eyes of the client. Uh, those of you who may know NIATEX, the uh, Improvement for Addiction Treatment uh, Initiative, they introduced walkthroughs to many of the substance abuse programs. And this assessment is really designed to look at each step from the first contact with the court to referrals for treatment and other options, to identify triggers and develop an action plan that includes several possible solutions for each 
hypertension trigger. The constant question that I raised is could this procedure or step or practice upset or trigger a client? Again, unintentionally, but the, could it upset or trigger a client? This assessment was designed as the walkthrough, not as a judgment, because when it was originally designed by Maxine and Roger, they really looked at it as a pre and post sort of measure where you do this assessment and then you do your work in between and then you look at it again. I wanted to take the judgment piece out and really use it almost as an intervention for teams and, and staff to gather the information together looking through the trauma lens with a focus on are we re-traumatizing with any of our practices. Because we know that some of our practices can be triggering or re-traumatizing, again, unintentionally. And then the trainings and technical assistance grew out of the action plan that we developed. And I have to say, this was a wonderful um, experience because we had quite a few people walking through the family drug court. And Judge Hugh invited me in to observe the court to begin with, and then we spent a number of weeks, four to five weeks, with the major team members looking and walking through the processes. So some of the examples just on safety, are security personnel present? Well, yes, in the drug court system, as you could see from the pictures, uh, yes, security personnel are present. and. Some of them have guns. How would you describe reception and waiting room? Is there a children's space? Are the first contacts with children welcoming, or with clients welcoming, respectful, and engaging? Do clients receive clear explanations and information about each program procedure? So what we did, here's an example from Santa Clara that we talked about the assessment area, the safety in the courthouse and courtroom. And some of the issues that were picked up as potential triggers were the security staff with guns. Again, some of them can be modified and some of them can't be. Crowded waiting rooms, children upset, lack of privacy, conversations, and the batterer may be present. These were some of the potential triggers. And some of the potential changes just around those that the mentors and the in Santa Clara Family Drug Court have wonderful team of mentors, mentor moms and men, mentor dads. And we felt that they could greet the clients and help them through security, telling them what to expect, walking ahead of them and showing them that it is safe. Children could wait in another area or a site nearby until needed in court social worker or a domestic violence specialist who attend the court hearings can sit with the clients and discuss procedures with them. These were just some of the potential changes that could have been made. And the more potential changes suggested, the better. So here are some of the steps that we took uh, in the Santa Clara Family Drug Court process. There was an initial conference on trauma with a plenary that I did and workshops. And then meeting with the key partners, and as you could tell from Judge Hughes' presentation, fabulous partners, and a design of an action plan. And the question that kept coming up, what does trauma-informed look like, which is, I think, a very important question, which is why I'm really sharing with you what it should look like, and what Judge Hughes shared with the observation of the court to assess whether there were triggers, design of the trauma assessment walkthrough, and then the walkthrough with the key partners, and then the formulation of the plan. So we had the issues, potential triggers, possible solutions. And there was an open invitation to the partners to use me to implement any of the trauma assessments or anything else that fit better. Many people. I did call me. We had a number of trauma assessments. We also had other kinds of trauma discussions 
because uh, for the, a group of attorneys, they did not have an agency or a system to walk through, but they had some issues that they wanted to discuss. Um, trauma training of court staff grew out of the action plan, and the training went very well. The trauma trainings for agency staff, we had a number of agency staff that wanted uh, basic trauma 101. I did that. We had uh, a number of people asked for men and trauma because so much of the focus had been on women. We did training on that. We also developed, we were asked to develop trauma-informed children's activities, did that. And then we trained the child providers in Santa Clara on the trauma-informed children activities. The development of a trauma-informed parenting module was asked. We did that and then trained the parent training coordinators on the trauma-informed parenting module. And I designed that so that it could be a very small recession parenting a module that could either be inserted into other parenting uh, trainings that were going on, or that it stood by itself as a trauma-informed parenting model. And then there were ongoing consultations and technical assistance. And of course, people could access the evidence-based practices. Um, seeking safety is being used in, seek, in uh, Santa Clara in the substance abuse programs and trauma-focused cognitive behavioral therapy is being used uh, for the children in mental health. So to summarize what's needed for transformation is really commitments from all the collaborative partners to engage over a long enough period of time, multi-level training for providers and partner staff, a continuous system assessment and modification, trauma-specific services available in a number of partner sites, internal and or external consultants knowledgeable of trauma-informed systems and trauma-specific interventions. Uh, I think that's really important. I want to say something about uh, the internal. What we really recommend is that for every agency who has a trauma champion, that is a person who would sort of be the overseer of trauma-specific and trauma-informed services and systems, and that they keep up to date um, on all the research and all the work and all the evidence-based practices that are being developed and modified. So that trauma champion uh, becomes the agency trauma expert. And when you have a collaboration, such as the Family Drug Court in Santa Clara with numerous partners, you can imagine that if every agency had a trauma champion, then if some there's turnover, and all of us know that there's turnover in our agencies, people are moving on, there are cuts, et cetera, reality sets in, that you have enough trauma champions within the system that people can then pick up some of the training of new staff happen, because we want to keep the staff up to date on trauma-informed and trauma -informed. So I, I really see the Family Drug Court as a laboratory for change. It's an excellent place to bring a large group of providers and court personnel together and really make important changes and lead us to a trauma-informed and sensitive system. Thank you. Oh, before I close, let me just tell you about the resources that um, are provided here. Um, the first is Roger Fallett and Maxine Harris, their original self-assessment and planning protocol is up on the internet. Uh, we are now just finishing a paper for publication together, uh, myself and Maxine and Roger, on the trauma assessment I'm talking about with you today, about the walk through, uh, and hopefully that will be published and we'll get that uh, up to you as soon as we can express. SAMHSA's National Center for Trauma-Informed Care was developed after the 
Women with Co-occurring Disorders and Violence Study. And the National Trauma Consortium is the group of nine sites that did the study, and we banded together to form the National Trauma Consortium. And we have written uh, over 70 papers that are published. They're up on the site, as well as a children's curriculum from the four sites that did the children's uh, project. And uh, last but not least is the National Child Traumatic Stress Network. They have done remarkable work for trauma and children. And they have uh, wonderful resources up on the internet. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Brown. That was wonderful information. Um, we did actually receive a question. Um, can you review stages one and two briefly again? Yes. Stage one is safety and stabilization. And that really means, again, that you're focused on building trust, making sure the person is safe both physically and psychologically, and beginning to learn new coping to stabilize themselves and be able to handle some of the uh, situations that may trigger them. Stage two is when you move past stage one, and stage one can take quite a long time, but stage two now takes you into the individual trauma story, going in depth to really understand what happened to this particular person. That stage, we feel, it needs to be handled by an experienced clinician. Stage one, the group curriculum can be worked on by people who are just trained in that curriculum. And it can be a, a, a clinician for, for prototypes for my agency. We did Seeking Safety with both a mental health clinician and a peer recovering staff person. I hope that answers the question. Yes, great, great, Dr. Vivian. Thank you so much for spending a little more time clarifying that. Um, we'd like to go ahead and launch our last polling question. We would like to see to what extent have all staff members received appropriate training in trauma and its implications for their work. So please select from the following, the following options, and we'll go ahead and launch the question now. Okay, we'll give a few more seconds. Okay, great. We're going to go ahead and close the poll. So it looks like um, the majority of the audience today have had some extent, or at least a little bit of an extent, of appropriate training in trauma and its implications for their work. Um, Dr. Brown or Judge Yu, would you like to comment on the responses to this polling question? I, I would love to. Um, I want to say something about what we all recommended after the SAMHSA study about training. Um, we feel that it's really important for everyone to have basic training, the Trauma 101, basic training on trauma for every agency or system, including the receptionist staff, the welcoming staff people, so that they understand when someone calls and may be screaming at them or sobbing on the phone, that they understand what's happening, and they know how to handle that. Again, given that many of us helpers may also have been traumatized, it's important that we make sure that training also includes issues of uh, vicarious traumatization or secondary traumatization for ourselves, our, the helpers. We also then say that clinicians need to be trained in the trauma-specific interventions uh, and perhaps even a additional enhanced training on the trauma, taking the trauma issues up uh, further so that they can be introduced to stage two uh, in, in the interventions as well as the interventions. 
and that supervisors also have an opportunity to have their own level of training so that they understand some of the issues that may be coming up for the helpers. Can I add something? So in, okay, so in addition to what Vivian said, which I wholeheartedly agree with, um, to, where we can provide better service to those coming into the program, um, I felt it was really important for all of us to have training by from Vivian because it, it actually helped pave the way better. Because once everybody sort of was on the same page and understood why we were doing it and why it was so important to do it, it, it um, allowed us to address some of the people who didn't understand or who were maybe naysayers in the beginning because you know there were people who said oh you're just an enabling court this is just enabling or you're just going to be too nice you're not going to be able to be successful and to have that training as a base level of knowledge allowed us to go deeper faster and allowed the path to be more smooth so I think on multiple levels having this broad-based training is, is very important great thank you for sharing that Okay, so at this time, we would like to go over some of the questions from the audience. As a reminder, you can submit your questions using the panel box on the right side of your screen. We'll go ahead and give it a few seconds to see if any questions roll in at this time. Okay, great. So it looks like we received a question from the audience. Um, and the question is about having difficulty being trauma sensitive and also setting up accountability. So confronting clients in a trauma sensitive therapeutic manner and um, how, what's the best method for doing that? Well, I think Judge Yu really um, gave us the clues just by her um, discussing doing both the trauma-informed but also holding people uh, to some of the limits and the behavioral expectations. I think it's that balancing that's really important. So for us, you know, some of the words we would use is, um, so just as an example, we, we would have sometimes parents who would be coming in with dirty tests, and then they would say, oh, that's not our test. That's not my test. Just keep in mind, there was a situation where a mom was told by a social worker she had a dirty test, and the social worker wanted to take the child. Then the next week, the social worker came in and said she mixed up the test, and it wasn't that mother's test. Um, so there are situations where the client is right, and it's not their test. But over all, usually it's the client not ready to sort of admit that that was their dirty test. We say, okay, we're not saying that you used. We're not saying that, you know, that's your dirty test. But we're saying this is what it looks like. It looks like you've used. And in this situation, what, um, what we're observing is really important because you're trying to get your child back. And so if it looks like that, um, it's not going to be helpful to you. So next, we expect that next time your test will come back, if you're saying you didn't use and that's not your test, it'll be clean. But we just want you to be alert to the fact that we have this concern. That would be the first time. And then if it came back the next time still dirty, then we would push harder and we would, you know, um, sort of say, look, now we've got two dirty tests. We're not here to judge, and we're definitely, we understand that relapse is part of recovery, it's definitely understood, although not excused. So can, can you tell us, is there something going on that we need to know about, or is there something we can do to help? Um, we, we don't, we want to be here to, and we're invested in your success. So we'd always be focused on the positive, focused on trying to get the person through, but acknowledging that this is sort of something that's kind of a barrier that's going on for them now. Um, and then if it's the third time you say, okay, you know, it's just so rare that there would be three dirty tests in a row. And really being, again, trying to be strength-based in our communication, but just saying, this is not okay. So your social work has expressed a concern, and we're, um, she's going to have to move on her own track. There, we're going to have to have a legal hearing, but the legal hearing is sort of separate. Let's talk about what's going on with you now. So we wouldn't uh, let this go unaddressed. There would be legal hearings, maybe to modify the visitation, to supervise visitation or whatever. But basically trying to address it in the drug treatment setting 
in a therapeutic way. And, and you know, these things are so organic. And once these things started to be addressed with the parents, so often they would really start to break down and cry because they felt that safety that they could say, yes, I did use, and we would find out what was going on. Plus, we're getting all these reports. So we knew sometimes before they did what was going on with them because they, you know, they weren't used to sort of being that self-conscious that the, the boyfriend was now out of jail and he's calling her all the time and now all of a sudden she's under this stress. We knew what was coming down the pike before she did. So we could sometimes say, so how are things going with whatever his name is? And then that would open the door. We would know, but she didn't know necessarily that we would know because we would want her to be able to say it herself and come to that realization herself. So just using all the information but always being very respectful allowed us to be firm, not lose point of the message and the point of why the person was in the courtroom, but still be kind and um, respectful and transparent. Great. Thank you for that. Um, another question that we just received from the audience is, is there recommended trauma screening tools for the parents that are involved in the family drug court? Uh, I, I will definitely take that one. Um, there are a number of tools. In fact, I sent uh, some over to um, CFF for just in case people needed uh, a, some list of screening tools as well as the um, evidence-based practice for trauma-specific interventions. There are a number um, impact of event scale, affectionately IES-R, uh, the impact of event scale is a 22-item measure uh, for adults, and it assesses distress caused by traumatic events. And then there's an impact of event scale 8 for children and adolescents, and that's IES-8. Um, so the, that looks at, again, uh, distress caused by traumatic events, but for the children and adolescents. There is a, a PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder checklist, affectionately PCL. Uh, there's a civilian uh, test, and there's a military uh, measure. It's a 17-item measure, and that's looking at symptoms uh, of trauma, like re-experiencing, avoidance, disassociation, and hyperarousal. There is the Life Stressor Checklist, um, LSC-R, it's been revised, and that looks at 30 life events. There's a Post-Traumatic Stress Diagnostic Scale, that's a 49-item uh, instrument. There's a Clinician-Administered PTSD Scale, the CAPS, C-A-P-S, that's a 30-item structured interview. This would have to be someone who is an experienced clinician trying to make a diagnosis of post-traumatic stress disorder. And there's a trauma symptom checklist dash 40, TSC 40, uh, as you can see, a 40 item measure. Now, there are differences even in the screens. Screening uh, differences are some are looking at has the person experienced any trauma? Some are, if you've experienced a trauma, how did it distress you? And some are looking to diagnose post-traumatic stress disorder. So I just want to say trauma is the broadest issue. In order to have a diagnosis of post-traumatic stress disorder, it's, it's a it's diagnosis, and about one-third of people who've been traumatized make it to a diagnosis of post-traumatic stress disorder. We, we think that it is very important to know whether the person's been traumatized, period. And that would just mean looking at some of these screeners for has the person experienced a traumatic life event. Thank you so much, Dr. Brown. And we will go ahead and post all those screening and assessment tools that you discussed on our FDC blog. Um, directly following the end of this webinar. Oh, perfect. Um, oh, great. Oh, yeah, we'll also yeah, we'll provide the link to all those tools as well, and then the FTC blog link will be provided in, in um, a few moments here. 
Um, in addition, we'll also post any other questions that we received that we were unable to address during this during this presentation and their responses from the presenters. So thank you very much, Dr. Brown and, and Judge Yu for, for answering those questions. Here is a reminder of the upcoming webinars for 2012 and how to access previous webinars and their materials with the link provided at the bottom of the screen. The next webinar is scheduled for Wednesday, May 9th from 10 to 12 for Pacific Standard Time and it will provide information and discussion on the role of judicial leadership and ethical considerations. This webinar registration is opened and live at this time and we hope to see you all there. Applications are now being accepted to become a peer learning court. For more information about the application process and requirements to becoming a peer learning court, please visit the link provided on this slide. The Substance Abuse and Mental Health Service Administration in collaboration with the Office of Juvenile Justice Delinquency Prevention is hosting a national symposium for family drug court professionals. The purpose of the symposium is to engage a wide range of, of FDC professionals in discussion of FDC practices, research, and policy. For more information, please visit the website provided. Registration is free and it will open on July 1st. Lastly, please, please feel free to visit the Family Drug Court Community of Learning. It's a blog site for the Family Drug Court Learning Community. On this blog, you will find registration information about upcoming webinars, background information about featured presenter, presenters, and helpful resources to enhance your learning from their academy. Um, in addition, we'll also post those uh, tools, assessments and tools that um, Dr. Brown mentioned earlier. and. Um, as well as any additional questions that were not able to be answered today. You can also post comments, questions, and feedback um, as a way to exchange ideas and information. So the blog address you can find right here is www.familydrugcourt.blogspot.com. We thank you for joining us today and we want to thank our presenters for taking the time out of their schedule to provide us with this wonderful presentation. If you can please take a moment to complete our evaluation, you will be redirected to the evaluation after exiting this webinar. Feel free to contact us at any time with any additional questions or comments you may have. You can see our contact information listed here, as well as some additional resources and how to, and how to visit our, um, our Facebook page for, and uh, any general inquiries that you may have. You can con contact us at fdc at cffutures. Dot org. Again, thank you for joining us, and we hope that you have a wonderful rest of the day.